Hickok 45. Look what I've got. Yes, Smith & Wesson model 1917. Made in 1918. Shall we load it and shoot it? Let's put some bullets in the chambers. No, wait a minute. I think I have an easier method for that. <laughs> yeah, don't I? Look at that. It's loaded. It can be done much more easily. And I think it's ready to go now. So let's put a bullet on that target right in the middle if possible. Uh-oh. Shut. No, let's save the watermelon. Let's tease you all a little bit. Oh, nice. How about a two liter? Do I have another round? Oh, I did. Yeah, and I missed. So maybe I need to adjust the sights on this thing. Let me get the screwdriver out and readjust that rear sight a little bit. <laughs> yes, this is the model of 1917. Uh, oh, I had another round. Wow. Wow, did I really miscount my rounds. I would, in fact, I thought I was almost empty. Now, what do you do? Will that work? Hmm. No, that was not. This is like a joke I did intentionally done. Actually, uh, this gives me an opportunity to demonstrate here to y'all really early on in the video. <laughs> Uh, one of those little extra tidbits that I never charge you for is about cylinder rotation. On a Colt, a cylinder goes from well, kind of left to right clockwise. Now these were not designed to be loaded like that, but I can I think I can get it back in there. Uh, on a Smith & Wesson, I just pushed a bunch of dirt back in there probably. They, uh, they go the opposite way, okay? See when I turn the cylinder, see it's gonna go counterclockwise. So if I needed to get one round up to fire, I need to close the cylinder with a dead one, or the live one, to the right, like that. And then when I cock it, guess what's going to happen? I've got another chance to hit that two liter. Yeah. All right. He died with uh, a drama, so no charge, okay? Smith & Wesson, counterclockwise. All right, that's something to remember. See, if I'd been in combat, that would have been really important. Uh, yeah, it was a little easier to load with uh, a moon clip, although I don't think they had any of those back during World War I or even II, did they? Don't believe so. They had the half moon clips, and uh, you've seen these before. This is what were issued with this revolver, okay? World War I, even World War II, and they were used in between and afterwards. Uh, very popular uh, revolvers, these 1917s, not just in the military but uh, outside the military, hey, how about right here? I enjoy shooting them. And so back when revolvers ruled anyway, you can imagine how popular a nice big old revolver was, fired a 45 uh, caliber round, or 44, okay? And they uh, were used in, uh, of course, in Britain, in the World War I uh, and II, the uh, uh, Chamberlain 455 Webley. So, uh, so much history with these things, and uh, I want to uh, give you some of it, not too much of it, because I don't know too much of it. I know enough to be dangerous, but this is one I did not have. Some of you might have seen it. I think I brought it out in a Sunday uh, shoot-around, uh, maybe a few months ago, uh, even. Uh, we've had the, uh, I've had the, uh, the model uh, Colt 1917 for five or six years, and you've seen it a few times. I didn't have one of these. These are uh, not quite as plentiful. They tend to be more expensive, but I ran across one several months ago, and this is it. And it still has a white paint from World War I. <laughs> no, I did that so I could see the front sight, okay? Didn't help on that two liter, did it? Uh, so now I have a Smith & Wesson model 1917, so I've got the pair, okay? But I, just, I brought it out here, but mainly in this video, I just wanna focus on Smith & Wesson We'll do a comparison, but uh, they're very similar in a lot of ways, but they don't have the same history, uh, the lineage. You know, they came about in different ways, but they both fire that 45 ACP uh, cartridge using these clips, and uh, the same one that 1911 used and uh, still uses, and, uh, and so they had that in common, and they're big revolvers, okay? And we'll, we'll talk about that. I'll, oops, I'll devote a little more time to that in a comparison, so you can watch for that. Might be up already, who knows? Depends on when you're seeing this. So uh, yeah, I wanted to mainly uh, today is give you kind of a, a, a little focus on Smith & Wesson. Smith & Wesson, wow, they have so many firearms. You know, they had back in 1850s, they came out with what, the first 22, sh short of the 22 caliber, 
cartridge gun. And uh, they've had so many different firearms variations uh, the firearms, and they, they specialized in the top brakes, you know, from early on, the Schofields, the number threes, and all those. And, and uh, even some of them were double action later and all that. And they were big into the top brake. And uh, they didn't copy Colt and other companies much, I don't think. But one thing they did finally, I think most people would agree, they did copy Colt on was when they went to the, the side cylinder breakout like that, okay? And got away from the top brake because this is a stronger system. You got the top strap that doesn't, doesn't break, okay? And uh, so the, anyway, this is the Smith. Now I've got the Model 10 out just to kind of back up a little bit before I talk about that. Uh, Smith & Wesson, you know, late 1890s and early part of the 20th century, they came out with these hand ejector models, you know, hand ejector with your hand, you eject those empties, right, instead of top brake. And I think that it was the third model, the 1905, that was pretty much like this Model 10. This is an old Model 10, you know, K-frame, 38 Special, okay, classic, classic, classic. And uh, the, the uh, believe, uh, tell me if I'm wrong, the third model, uh, the first hand ejector, or the hand ejector, third model, I think it was pretty much the model 10, okay, but it was 38 caliber. So they were the 38, I think there was a series of two or three of them, and they were the 38 hand ejectors, okay? Again, hand ejector, when you hear me say that, that's, that's why they called it that, all right? And, uh, and so, then in uh, uh, around 19, uh, what was it, 07, 1908, 1907, I guess the design, they kind of beefed up and made the 44 hand ejector. See, ejects the same way. In 44 Special, that was also the beginning of the 44 Special cartridge around 1907. And, uh, and it, it, it had used a regular cartridge, you know, with a rim and everything. Okay. But it was a lot like this handgun, a lot like this one, all right? Uh, didn't use clips or anything. But it was called also the triple, I had a lot of names, the New Century, the triple lock, uh, the first model, hand ejector, 44, and all kinds of names for it. A lot of people call it the triple lock. You'll hear that used a lot. Why? Because unlike this one and unlike this one and most revolvers you see, it locked back here, the back of the... Uh, a cylinder of course and locked up here at the front of the cylinder but it also locked right in here there was another uh, little shrouded uh, lock that locked in like some handguns still do the gp100 does and i the only reason i brought out this ruger red hawk is to show you that i don't have a triple lock uh you know there's a lock right here locks right there on the, uh, the crane so it, it actually locks there Okay, well, the Smith locked out here and there and back here, of course. So, three locks. Hey, triple lock. wonder why people started calling it that. So, it wasn't like this one, but just to show you, you had a lock there as well. Okay. And, uh, I, I don't know, I guess they thought maybe they needed it because it was a 44 caliber, you know, big and all that. And uh, very uh, kind of over-engineered, a lot of people would, would claim, but a beautiful gun and solid and Smith has always had a nice finish, just well-made firearms, sometimes considered a little more fragile than the Colts, but, but just really nicely made. Okay, so that's the triple lock, and it was made till about 1915. That was the first hand ejector, classic gun. Uh, they're so collectible. I had one way back. <laughs> yeah, I think it had been refinished in some different things, but had one for a little while. And, uh, you know, 44 Special, you know, great cartridge, great gun. All right, so that was a real claim to fame in a lot of ways for Smith and Wesson. And then, if I can get my timetable correctly, uh, it was around uh, you know, the 1915, I guess it was. Uh, Britain, you know, they're at war over there across the ocean, and World War One's going on. We're not in it yet. We got into it in 1917, I think April. So this is before we were involved in it. We're making firearms for everybody that's in it. <laughs> big, big numbers of them, right? Rifles, handguns, and everything. And uh, so Britain, I think Colt might have already been making uh, revolvers for, for Britain and 455 Webley. Uh, at some point there, they were making them too. 
Well, they wanted uh, you know a contract with Smith and Wesson, and they wanted some of these, the triple locks, you know. But they didn't think that third lock was necessary. It was just overly complicated and would foul up, and maybe, and they didn't need the checkered grips, and I don't know what else. I think one. I don't think they wanted a shorter barrel necessarily. That was the U.S. military that wanted a five and a half inch barrel. I think most of these were six and a half inch barrel when they came out. So anyway, we, we got to sign a big contract with, with Britain, settled on that in the simplification to some extent of the triple lock. So that became the second, basically the second uh, hand ejector model, okay? This, the triple lock was the first. So this one was a little bit less complicated, but pretty much the same firearm except for the thing that had a lanyard on it and you know smooth grips and just two locks and chambered in 455 webley that was their cartridge okay sold them a bunch of them i think around seventy-five thousand or more okay for world war one and that essentially being the, the second uh as i say a hand ejector model and that's what we based this on because so now they're making this smith is making the second uh hand ejector model and so at some point there the government comes to Smith and Wesson and Colt of course and hey we need some guns we didn't have enough of these okay they're making them feverishly but you know it just takes time and it hadn't even been out all that long so the 1911s not nearly enough of them and uh, so and they wanted those on the front lines as much as possible and so we, they contracted with uh, Smith and, and Colt, and I, I think Smith made about 160,000 of these, Colt, some number similar to that uh, for, for the government. And, uh, and it was basically this gun, guess why? It's once in my hand. You know, uh, so this is the gun that Smith made for the US government, and they wanted it chambered, of course, in the same cartridge the 1911 took. And uh, Smith and Wesson figured that out first. Uh, Joseph Wesson, the son of Daniel Wesson, he's the one who supposedly came up with this, this clip idea. Uh, there was somebody before that, I think, that had one that was way, way different. But this was uh, from Smith and Wesson, this idea. And the government convinced them to give it to Cole, too. Hey, let them use it. Let's not worry about patents. Guess what? We're in, in the war now. Okay, we're going to war. And uh, so that made things easier. That way you could take the same cartridge for you really new folks to guns, uh, you have no rim really on a automatic cartridge like this. And so if you put it in there, it, uh, the early ones and the Colts especially would just fall on through, okay? Because there's no rim to hold and see the ejector doesn't catch it or anything. So you need something like that. And uh, they had these half moon clips. You know, I don't think there were full moon clips back at that time. So I'm not sure they called them half moon clips, right? If you don't have a whole moon, do you even have a half a moon? Does that thing exist? So you put two of those in there, and there you go. The same thing. I put a full moon clip in when I started. Those came about later, and uh, that's what people use these days, of course. And uh, so much easier to load, much easier to load. And, of course, the ejector engages that clip and pulls them out. See, you notice your rims back there, and then you got the metal from the clip. So they needed more room between the back of the uh, cylinder and that. That's why... I can't take like one of my 45 Colt revolvers or something and, and, and I can put these in. They'll go into, I don't have one over here doing a, a new service. They'll go in just fine, but you can't close the cylinder. Okay, not enough gap. So this is made for the 1917s or the, some of the more modern versions of it. All right, so let's try these World War I or World War II uh, clips and block clip basically. It goes in there and stays in there, okay. And uh, see if we can hit anything. This is a really nice firearm. I'll shoot that watermelon. It will not explode or go crazy because it's just a 45. But I thought, why not? See? At least it'll bleed. <laughs> and of course, it's double action or single. Let's go double. Oh, it's more powerful than double action. John didn't tell me that. <laughs> that was a joke, people. You don't get more power out of double action. Okay, so then you eject all that together and you'd have these in a pouch and yeah, and you just pull them out and load some more, okay? Not that this is a great offensive <laughs> weapon or something, you know, we don't go to war, a handgun war, right? Uh, but, you know, it's, it's good to have one. 
they not a lot of these were on the front lines necessarily they were you know truck drivers and uh, artillery people anybody that needed a handgun couldn't handle a garand at the time you, you know the story on that there's so many different positions support positions and i'm sure some of them made it to the front lines but uh there's just so many people so many different jobs they're in harm's way you know my dad was one of them you know in the truck company and he had a 1911 part of the time, two different ones he told me about, an M1 carbine at one point, depending on what they're doing and where they are. Uh, but uh, a handgun is, is very, very convenient, okay? And these are quicker to load. And it's a 45 caliber. Ammo is not an issue. Same ammo they're shipping over there for the 1911s, right? So, uh, cool gun. So this is a second model, uh, you know, hand ejector and uh, it's what the 1917 is based on and they're they're really nice they're very popular as i said outside the military too you, any number of movies you're liable to see this one or the colt one or the other and that someone's carrying it you know policemen sheriffs whatever back in the day just just really uh really nice old guns uh, like i say the brits bought about seventy-five thousand of these at least and uh, chambered in their cartridge and uh, then we made about 160,000, I think, for for the 45 ACP of uh, the Smith. I'm mainly talking about the Smith, okay. And uh, and the thing I was, I was showing you earlier, uh, the Smith early on put that shoulder there in the chamber so it would stop. See, I, and let me demonstrate for you because you might not believe me. Uh, do I have anything to punch them out? Yeah, I do. I'll shoot it just like so. You can shoot it like this. Uh, now the early Colts. For about the first month or so of production, they didn't, and uh, the round would just go on in there. So you couldn't shoot it if you didn't have a clip. It was just useless, totally useless. It was just a piece of metal. So it's nice that Smith did this, and then Colt did it later on, because you know you're in a pinch and you don't have clips, but you got ammo. Yeah, you, you can shoot the thing. Now watch it not fire. Of course, they fired them one-handed. You realize, unlike us, just like that. At least they were taught to fire them one-handed. Well, there might have been some Jeff Coopers in World War I that figured out a better way. Who knows? <laughs> Click. So now the only problem is if I needed to get those out of there really quickly and reload because there's still the enemy is out there. <gasps> Look what I've got, you know. Uh-oh. Well, maybe your fingernails, you know, will get it. Yeah, because you do have that rim protruding a little bit. So you could do that. My, my method would be, if I had something handy, it's a lot quicker and easier to just punch them out, okay? So, uh, you know, there you go. So it would work with the clips or without them. And now uh, the company, Peter's Ammunition or whatever they were called, they came up with the 45 auto rim later after World War I. And I've had some of those and used them in my old 625. And that's a round that does have a, it's the same cartridge basically but it has a rim like a 45 colt or something and then you can just fire them in these things i didn't have any i gave those away to the person i sold that gun to i think and i, I can't even show you one but they still need this gap to work properly in one of these you can't really fire those in a standard 45 long colt revolver as well they won't you, they jam up just like these do you can't close the cylinder i'll show you what i mean again you gotta i did already didn't i you, that whoa Oh, what am I talking about? I don't even have one to show you. But it, it just can't close the cylinder. They'll fit in there, but you can't close it. Can I shoot it again? And then I'll uh, bore you with a couple more uh, things and then uh, maybe let you go. Uh, I know what you're waiting for, right? <laughs> uh, let's shoot one over there uh, at the gong. I, you Man, since I painted that front sight and I, I haven't shot it that much, I've got all kinds of excuses. I'm not sure where to hold. At least I can see the sight, though. Might have heard something there. Yeah, there's that sound. There's that sound. Let's try that pig. He's just hanging there. Yeah, waiting to get shot. Nice, nice. Let's bowl a little more. And let's hit that orange too later. No, let's don't. Let's say we did. Now I don't have that problem I had before. Look at that. Pull them out, I could put another one in, I'm ready to go. How's that? So, uh, that's the way this thing is built. Uh, there were commercial versions after the war. Uh, I think they made 50 or 60,000 after World War I. And uh, 
sold a bunch of them in the 30s to Brazil and uh, like about 25,000 so you may see some with a Brazilian crest on the side and they're available uh, so there, there are a lot of made a lot of them are out there I believe there are almost 200,000 of them were stowed away after World War One and uh, just in government warehouses you know where they keep all the guns and uh, when World War II broke out guess what imagine that still didn't have enough 1911s <laughs> we never do or you know, a war comes out uh, and so they got those out of mothballs, cleaned them up, refurbished some of them that needed it, whatever they needed, and put them back into action. I have read that they're actually probably used more, both the Smith and the Colt used more in World War II than in World War I, you know, because we had them all there and, and they put them into service immediately, didn't have enough 1911s. And I don't know uh, as much as I should know about World War I versus World War II, but I can, more uh, maybe involvement and more need for even more firearms and handguns and that kind of thing. So they were out there for that, uh, no doubt about it. Uh, but anyway, and, and I was going to say too about my other one, the Colt, I think, is it looks like it's been uh, parkerized. I know they, they parkerized some of them for World War II. So that one may have seen action in World War I, you know, and World War II. I also read that uh, they got some of these out for Vietnam. Uh, the tunnel, some of the tunnel rats wanted one of these instead of a, a uh, you know, a uh, 1911. So, or that's all they had, I don't know. You know, in wartime, it's a crazy time. As you, if you've been in the military, you could probably address that, of course, how supplies don't get there when they should, or the wrong things, or you need more than you've got, or just, who knows what and sometimes you probably end up in a situation where you make do with what you can or what, what you can get okay and uh, you could do worse you could do worse than one of these things i'm gonna shoot it one more time I, I said i was finished but you know what i'm not i gotta shoot it again is that all right uh, so shoot this and the others oh and one thing too after the war they went back to i think checkering the the grips and uh, there had been a shroud here too around the ejector rod that was something i was going to show you over here too that was another thing the Brits didn't want or need, the shrouded uh, ejector rod like that. And so uh, Smith took that off the triple lock. You see it's not shrouded. And uh, then later, I think they went back to that. But they've always, I think, had a pretty nice finish on them. You know, they really have. And uh, just fun guns. I think you can kind of see. 45 ACP is a nice cartridge, but it's not like a 44 Magnum. It's convenient to shoot. It doesn't knock you around too much. You know, it's just fun. It's a fun shooting around. Huh, cowboy? Uh-oh. <laughs> so even double action, you know, they work just fine. So uh, really nice revolver. This is basically the, the first, these are the first in-frame revolvers, you know, is what it amounts to. And, uh, but they've got so much more history. You know, pin-barreled. <laughs> and uh, uh, half moon sights, uh, what else to tell you about? They had a color case hardened hammer and trigger. And uh, they were a lot like this one, the Smiths were, uh, for a pretty good reason. Because this is one of them. You see the little bomb imprint on there? This one was a war machine. The serial number is on the, uh, on these, it's on the, the grip, on the bottom of the barrel, and on the cylinder. And they all match on this one. Okay, now the Colts are a little bit different. We'll talk about maybe later. And uh, just just a, a cool gun. I mean, wow. They, they, this very firearm uh, was very likely uh, used in some capacity, World War I and World War II. Uh, we just no way to know, right? Uh, in between, uh, could have been Vietnam. That's in pretty good shape, so I don't know how much it was used. Could have been used by a tunnel rat in Vietnam. Uh, all the way back to uh, in World War One in some capacity, right? And it's a firearm that you or I can own and shoot and enjoy with a cartridge that's still very, very popular. So uh, the good old 1917 Smith and Wesson, uh, a part of their history, and I think an interesting part of their history, right? So I'm glad you came out, and I hope I didn't bore you too much. I hope I didn't tell you too many lies. Uh, I know enough to be a slightly dangerous, and I know enough uh, that these firearms like this are just really, really interesting, you know, pieces or, or tools, pieces of hardware for me. So, 
1917 Smith & Wesson uh, second model or model 1917. Pretty nice, pretty nice revolver. Everybody should own one. Life is good. Uh, fire. It's a long walk from where I had to shoot that. Oh man. Oh hey, didn't see you guys there. Since you're here, I want to let you know about our friends over at Talon Grips and Ballastall. TalonGunGrips.com. Check out everything they have over there. You can get lots of different grips, the stick on grip textures for your handguns and rifle grips. So go check them out. Also, Ballastall, they're a firearms lubricant or anything else you might need lubricating. Uh, it's water soluble and non toxic. Been using it on the compound and cleaning all of our guns. It's a cleaner and a lube for over 10 years. So, Ballastall, Talon Grips, definitely check both of those companies out. And also, while you're on the internet, don't forget to go to Hickok45.com. You can also find us on Facebook, Hickok45, Twitter, Hickok45, Instagram, The Real Hickok45. And also, I have an Instagram page where I post behind the scenes stuff and different things like that. John, J O H N underscore H I C K O K 45 on Instagram. And uh, the next thing you have to do is watch more videos.